Welcome to Category 5 Technology TV. It's just me, Robbie, here this week because, hey, I've told Sasha and Jeff to stay home. We are under a severe winter storm here in Ontario, Canada. That guy who just drove by is really brave because they're telling us to stay off the roads. Uh, but I'm here this week, so we're going to do a show just kind of like old school style. It's just you and me. Tonight we're going to be looking at that NAS unit that I've uh, been putting together and we're going to see if we can actually create a little bit of a NAS system uh, from an Odroid XU4. It's kind of cool because we're going to be able to save a lot of money, not just on the equipment itself, but also on the electricity moving forward. Stick around. Live recordings are trusted only to solid-state drives by Kingston Technology. Revive your computer with improved performance and reliability over traditional hard drives with Kingston SSDs. Category 5 TV streams live with Telestream Wirecast and Nimble Streamer. Tune in every week on Roku, Kodi, and other HLS video players. For local showtimes, visit Category5.tv. Welcome to the show, everybody. It is brutal outside here in central Ontario. I arrived here at the studio just before the storm really hit, and it is looking like it's going to be a white Christmas here in Ontario. And now, our studio is in Barrie, and we're about an hour north of Toronto, and uh, I've given everybody the week off. And uh, it, it just happens to be me because I, I got here just before the announcement was made and I, I can't really send myself home. So here I am. Folks, we're going to have a great show. Before I get into it, though, I want to remind you to subscribe to us on YouTube and click the bell. That's going to make sure that you receive notifications anytime that we're live or anytime that we have uh, new videos that we post uh, on YouTube. So make sure you uh, subscribe to us. Another thing about that is that it, it lets us know that you appreciate what we do here at Category 5 TV. As the subscriber numbers increase, that is a great encouragement to us. And another way that you can support us and show us that you love us is by becoming a patron. So head on over to patreon.com slash category five. That's a really cool way to support us by just throwing a little bit in the tip jar. And that gives you exclusive access to behind the scenes video, our vlog as well. And, uh, and you also gain access to the live recordings each and every week. So what we take from the live show, we edit out all the bloopers and the behind the scenes and everything else before we post it publicly live. But by that point, we've already posted the live feed to the patrons. And as you know, anything that gets posted on the internet is there forever. There's no going back. So our patrons gain access to that indefinitely. So make sure that you, uh, that you, you know, if you want to support us, that's a great way to do it. Patreon.com slash category five. Over the past couple of weeks, uh, I and the team have been speaking about uh, our, what we're going to call my NAS, your NAS, my NAS, but cat5.tv slash my NAS is where I'm going to put all the links for the products that we're going to be looking at. Um, the discussion has been surrounding the decision, okay, well, do we go with USB 3.0 so that we can also gain the uh, eSATA port, which is going to give us up to 6 gigabits per second, or do we go straight to uh, USB 3.1 Rev 2, which theoretically can, can give us up to 10 gigabits per second, However, the one caveat about that is that the device that we're going to be connecting it to, which is an Odroid XU4 single board computer, is only capable of USB 3.0 with UASP. So that's going to be 5 gigabits per second. That's a lot of numbers to be thrown out at you. It's a lot of numbers for old Robbie to, to remember in this bald head of his, but it all makes sense to me. Uh, the decision was made, though, to go future ready and go with USB 3.1 Rev 2. So we're going to be able to access our NAS unit at 5 gigabits per second from the, uh, from the Odroid XU4. But keep in mind, 
our connectivity to our NAS is going to be based on gigabit Ethernet anyways, because the Ethernet port on that board is uh, is a thousand megabits per second or whatever. So it, even though I can uh, like communicate with the drives at five gigabits a second, the communication then to the XU4 is only going to be one gigabit a second. So the theoretical uh, result of that is that the communication between the brains of our NAS is still going to be five times as fast as our actual throughput to, uh, to and from that NAS unit itself. <clears throat> So I've got this uh, this device at cat5.tv slash uh, my NAS. And let's get a quick look at it. Now I've put the drives, I've put two drives in here, obviously not very stably. Uh, we'll work on that in just a second. This guy just fell right out. That's okay. Uh, okay, so I've got two four terabyte drives that I've just simply plugged into the back back plane because I was just kind of playing around with this just before the show to see how it operated. And it, well, I didn't even really turn it on. Um, I just wanted to see that I could plug these drives in and see how they connect. So I have two four terabyte drives from my old backup unit and. The idea behind this is I'm going to be able to use this device as basically just multiple drives connected to my computer. So this is a NAS enclosure. Well, not a NAS enclosure. This is a hard drive enclosure. There's a big difference when you're shopping around for these kinds of things. So keep this in mind. What we opted for, what I opted for is not a NAS unit. That's not what we want. We want a device that gives me access to these drives as external hard drives. So this has four SATA uh, backplanes. Uh, the backplane will take up to four SATA drives. And with that, um, I'm going to see four new hard drives, just like as if I plugged in a USB external hard drive on my computer. That's the theory behind it. So there's no raid happening here. There's no mirroring. There's nothing. It's just four drives connected to my Linux machine, the XU4. So then using the amazing software that comes with Linux, I'm going to be able to, I mean, because Linux is like the server OS, right? We're going to learn this week. And we've learned from the top 500 that like Linux is where it's at for servers. Um, so because they're going to be showing up as four individual SATA external hard drives, I can do whatever I want with them. So we're going to play around with mirroring, creating arrays. We're going to be checking out all the various things that we can do. But this device will take up to four drives. So we can decide how we want to segment the data across those four drives. I've just got two drives for the sake of the demonstration today. And this is what it looks like. So there we have it. And it's just simply a very basic uh, SATA backplane that gives me access to these drives. So as far as the mounting goes, there is really no, there's no drive trays or anything like, like that. There are these little plastic guys that are going to go on the front of the drive, which just gives it a little bit more pressure to push it into the backplane. Um, so these just go in like this. Drive number one. And that squeezes right into the back plane. Drive number two, both four terabytes, just because these are pulls uh, from my, uh, my old backup. Let's see here. You can see that better than I can. And there we go. Straight in there. And then this guy here is just going to go right on top. And clip in like so. I think I've almost got that. It clips in anyways. And then you close the door and you're good to go. So should we fire it up and just kind of see how this is going to um, show up on our computer? I've got my laptop here and what I'm gonna do is uh, let's quickly, uh, let's zoom in first of all and do a LS slash uh, dev slash SD star. I just want to see what's there. So I only have one hard drive in my laptop and uh, that is my SDA. Let's also bring up going to zoom out here a little bit and I'm going to bring up gpartEd just so that we can get a look at what this is going to look like as far as hard drives go. So there is my SDA and that's the only hard drive available in my computer. So to power it on there's just a power button here and what I have is I've got USB 3.1, uh, USB-C 2 uh, 
a USB um, standard A cable uh, to plug into my laptop, and that is the same. Pardon me, the same cable I'm going to use to connect it into my uh, into my XU4. Now I just heard a ding on my laptop, so let's see what's uh, what's going on here. So in G Part Ed, what do we see? I'm going to go G Part Ed refresh devices over here. Now I have two 3.64 terabyte drives, is what it's showing. Both unallocated space. That's good news. All right, over here, let's zoom in a little bit and let's run that same command. And now we see we have SDB, SDC, SDD, and SDE. Now, I imagine, see, we're seeing SDD and SDE. So understand these are drive allocations as far as how Linux segments the devices. So we've got SDA is my actual internal hard drive on my laptop. SDB is presumably the first slot in this, I, if they are sequential. SDC would be the second, SDD would be the third, and SDE would be the fourth. If I'm right, then we're going to find that we're able to, well, I mean, we can confirm that, again, by going into GParted. That's a quick way to confirm it anyways. Well, if I knew my password and entered it correctly. Yes, SDB and SDC. So SDB is going to be my first drive in the, uh, in the chassis. SDC is going to be my second. So what am I going to do? Well, first of all, I want to format these XFS. So I'm going to need a couple of tools. So sudo su and log in as super user. And I'm going to go apt update. Move this over a little bit for you folks at home. Do I want to accept these changes? Why, yes, yes, I do. All right. Apt install XFS progs. Ah, look at that. I've already got it. Okay, so. What file system would you consider for your NAS? You might think ext4. You might even think, like, maybe ButterFS. Now, there's a couple of things that, um, that I would consider when I'm creating this array. First of all, um, XFS is a modern file system that has a virtually limitless number of files that I can have on my NAS, so, uh, on my file system. So it's unbelievable. Like, it's like to the power of. Uh, we can't even count that high. Um, it allows massive amount, like massive capacity drives, and it's a modern journaling file system. Now, ButterFS, it's a great file system. I love ButterFS. However, I still feel like there is some concern, some worry about ButterFS with um, unexpected power loss. And sometimes that can happen. We've had power outages here in our, our local community where um, the power has been out so long that the UPS finally gives up. Um, and if that happens, I don't want to have data loss or parity issues. So XFS is able to maintain its file system much more adequately um, because ButterFS has um, uh, an issue where it can actually lose parity data if the power goes out. So that's something that I want to avoid in my array because if I ever lost any parity data in my array, then if a drive failed, um, then I would have problems rebuilding my data and I could potentially have some data loss. That's exactly what I want to avoid. So now that I have XFS uh, progs installed, which gives me makefs, now let's partition our drive. So, I, and notice I'm doing this in the terminal, folks. I want to do this in the terminal so that you can see um, how it's actually done. We could use the GUI, but you, I want you to be able to do this in the terminal. So FDisk, we know that it's going to be dev slash SDB. That's my first one, OK? So if I do a P, I can see that this is a four terabyte drive. See there, 3.7 terabytes. And then it's like four point blah, blah, blah bytes. It's all like rounded to 1024. Uh, so we're going to create a, a new uh, partition. Now, if you need help, just push M and enter because M stands for what? Help. Yes, that makes a lot of sense. But you see, of course, the first command that we're going to need is N 
for a new partition. So press N, enter, partition number. I'm just going to hit enter, and then first sector, enter, and then last sector, enter, because I want to use the whole drive. Do you want to remove the signature? And what's that asking me? Hey, this drive already has a file system on it, and it is a encrypted CryptoLux signature, probably created with Luke's dump as you are already aware, uh, because that's my old backup. Remember I mentioned that, but I know that I have now got a new backup. So this one is redundant and not needed and redundant to the point where it can be destroyed and I'm not losing anything. So do I want to remove that signature? Yeah. Okay, there we go. So I'm going to write it out with W and I'm done. So now if I do an F disk dash L slash dev slash SDB, I should see that I now have SDB one, which is my first partition on SDB, the first drive in my chassis. And it is a full 3.7 terabyte and it's set up for a Linux file system. Now I can't mount it yet because there's, there is no file system. So make FS, so MKFS dot XFS because we chose the XFS file system. You could also do ext4 right uh, but we're going to do xfs and i'm going to go dev sdb1 now one of the things that's really really nice about xfs is the speed at which it formats the drive this is a four terabyte drive and i would say it's probably going to be able to format that drive like in a tenth of the time that it would take for ext4 or something similar so so far I have one drive that is formatting XFS. I've partitioned it. It has a full four terabyte partition, we'll say 3.7 terabytes, and I'm formatting it with XFS using the Linux terminal. So this could be my, uh, and, and part of why I want to show you this in the terminal is because this could be my X, uh, XU4, which I could be SSH'd into, and this could be connected to the, um, the external uh, USB. That's already finished formatting, four terabytes. Can you believe that? done. So now I could actually mount that. So if I created a mount point, so let's go slash MNT, let's make a mount point, uh, make dir in uh, MNT. I'm going to call this, I'll just call it SDB1 just for fun because it's easy to understand what that means. And I think when I was learning Linux as a, as a rookie Linux user, I think mount points were something that really confused me. And so if you've never worked with mount points before in the terminal or you're not sure how this works, um, feel free to ask questions, but I'll do my best to explain it. Um, Linux works a lot different than, say, Windows. Windows uses, like, when you plug in a drive, it's like your C drive, it's your D drive, it's your E drive, and so on. Now, Linux, you can plug in 10 drives, and none of them have a drive letter. They can just be, like, one of them can be your, your boot, and one of them can be your root, and one of them can be your home folders, one of them can be your backup, and they're all connected through the file st the system structure. So in this case, I'm going to be putting that one drive on slash MNT slash SDB1 because I created a mount point, aka a folder at that point. But where, where it can get confusing is when I first started learning this stuff, I would... I would go into SDB1 now that I've created this folder and I might put some files there, but then I wouldn't even realize that the drive is not currently mounted. So any files that I put there are in fact going on my SDA, right? The built-in hard drive on my laptop because I have not yet connected this drive to that mount point. So the way that I'm going to do that and, and there are ways to permanently do that, but to temporarily do that just to test, I'm going to go mount slash dev slash sdb1, because we know that that's our first partition on that drive, which we formatted XFS. And then I'm going to mount that to slash mnt slash sdb1. So what I'm telling it is mount this partition, sdb1 in dev, to this mount point, aka folder sdb1 hit enter now if i go into sdb1 it looks exactly the same however i anything i do here is actually going on the external hard drive so now if i go back one folder and i unmount that which is the command is actually u mount sdb1 now if i go back into sdb1 and do an ls look it's empty well, where'd my files go? Because right now I'm actually looking at SDA because it's not mounted. Go back again and type my mount command. Go back in. 
Now I am, in fact, looking at the external hard drive. So that test file that I created is on the very first drive in this NAS chassis, in our chassis, our external chassis, right there. And if it's not mounted, I won't be able to access those files. So there's one other thing that I can do which is very, very helpful because what can happen, let's unmount that, SDB1. So now it's not mounted, okay? SDB1. If I look, now what can happen is I'm going to touch test 2. Okay, so now there's a file called test2. Now, if I go back and I run my mount command, watch what can happen. Do you notice? Okay, so test2 is there, right? Now, go into SDB1 and do an LS, and it's test. Well, where the heck did test2 go? I've lost my file. No, I haven't, because test2 <laughs> was on SDA because it wasn't mounted. So now I get confused. This is where I was at when I was just a rookie Linux user. Because if it wasn't mounted or if, it, if I forgot to mount my drive or if I didn't mount it correctly or I, put it, I mounted it in the wrong place, I put files on the mount point unmounted so they wouldn't end up on my external drive. So why does that matter? What if I ran a backup? What if I was backing up my SDA drive to my, X, to my SDB1, but it wasn't mounted. I would actually be copying the, the files from my SDA to my SDA, the same hard drive. So then that hard drive crashes, my backup is useless, absolutely useless. So how can I fix that? Well, if I unmount that drive, so U mount SDB1, because I'm in the mount folder, go back in there, I'm gonna remove test two, and now go back and now watch this chatter C H A T T R plus I that means make it immutable make it so that it can't be written to and then SDB 1 okay so now if I go into SDB 1 and I try again to touch test 2 it says no such file or directory what is it well I know there's a file a directory why can't I touch my file? Oh, I haven't mounted my directory yet. I haven't mounted my, my drive. So it's important to do that because now I can't write anything to the mount point. So now it will only work. My backup will only function if the, mount, if the drive is, in fact, mounted. So let's jump back here. Now that it is immutable, I can't do anything here. I can't make a directory in here. It will say operation not permitted. Go up a folder and now let's run our mount command again. So I'm pushing control R to be able to go back in my history. And now if I notice it mounted just fine. Now I'm going to go back into SDB1 and I'm going to, now you see my test file. Let's try ta uh, touching test two. Uh, touch, I can't type and talk. <laughs> test two, there we go. So now you notice that it did work because it is mounted. All right, so this is, in fact, the SDB1, the external hard drive now. And uh, if you're not sure if it's mounted, watch this. Mount, it gives me a list of all the drives that are mounted. Well, that's a whole bunch of cruft. So mount, pipe, grep, SDB1. That just gives me the one line that shows SDB1. So this shows me that dev SDB1 is mounted on slash MNT slash SDB1. Well, what happens if I unmount it and run that exact same command? no output because it's not currently mounted. So I know I need to mount it. Do it again. There we go. Now run that command. So what is it doing? It's, it's mount, which gives me an output of all of the mounted stuff, right? But then I'm grepping, which is basically the Linux equivalent of, hey, search that output for this, SDB1, and hit enter. And that could be anything. I could search for dev, and it will give me everything that contains the word dev. Well, no, I don't need that. I just want SDB1. And that gives me, and it's a little bit cluttered when I have it like that, but there you go. So you can see that I have dev sdb1 on mnt slash sdb1, and the type is xfs. That's my file system, and it's ready to go. So I have my first drive ready to go in my NAS. Second drive is going to be exactly the same, except we know that it is my sdc. So I'm going to go through those same steps in order to create that. Now, because this is not a RAID unit, I can put in four terabyte drives. I got my two four terabyte drives. I can also put in a one terabyte in addition to that. And I can put in a 500 gig 
so I can use a mix of drives, and it's gonna each one is gonna show up as STB, SDC, SDE, D, and E, <laughs> and uh, and then you're gonna have access to each of them. Now with a RAID, of course, if you had uh, two four terabytes, well, you could set those up as a RAID one, but then if you had a one terabyte and a and a 500 gigabyte, you couldn't really connect those together and use them. Um, what we're going to be doing over the course of this series is we're going to be demonstrating how we can actually use this unit or a unit similar to this. Um, in order to create arrays using Linux tools that will allow me to intermix drives, to be able to create redundancy. We're going to be creating all kinds of really cool stuff so that you can understand the underlying file system idiosyncrasies. And I think even tonight you may have learned a couple of things. Please comment below. Let me know what you did learn here and, and if anything is uh, of particular interest that I've uh, spoke on tonight. And uh, and through the course of the series, we're going to be learning all kinds of things like that. The little trinkets behind the, the like the the UI that we're used to. Like we may install like a, an interface um, on our NAS unit and, and all we ever see is the web interface. Well, we're going to be working under the hood so that we understand how it all works and keeping our data safe. So that's pretty cool. Hey, we've got to take a really quick break. Uh, I'll be right back. Stick around. Welcome back. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Now, um, our broadcast is live, even though you're watching this on demand. We do have some questions coming in in our Discord chat. Uh, first question comes from Marshman asking, okay, how is my laptop that I'm demonstrating on connected to the NAS? Now, I mentioned it at the top of the show, but you may not have catch, uh, caught it. Uh, and I'm just going to power this off because I have unmounted it with the U-mount command. So I'm just going to hold in that power button to power off those drives so I can safely move it. There it goes. Remember that these are spinning drives. You don't want to move this while they're spinning because you can actually cause damage to the physical platters of the drive. There are needles, basically, we're going to call them. Think of an old record, right? Like a record player, LPs. Um, you've got heads that hover on a very small cushion of air over top of very sensitive magnetic platters. So if I move this while it is powered on, those platters are moving at 7,200 rotations per minute. And so if... I move it in such a way that the head touches the platter, scratch, data loss, possible hard drive failure. So I always power this off before I move it. How am I connecting it? I'm just unplugging the uh, power here. This is the back of the unit. And all I have is a USB-C cable. Okay, so that's what it is on this end. Now on the laptop end, I'm just going to unplug that here. This is the other end of that same cable. So I've got USB-C and I've got USB-A. So this allows me to plug it into a laptop or any other USB 3.0 device. So that's my Odroid XU4. That's the what we hope to achieve through the course of this, uh, this project is to actually power this from a single board computer. The reason that I've chosen the XU4 is because it supports UASP. That's uh, USB attached SCSI protocol, which means it's going to be able to get five gigabits per second data transfer for to the device. Uh, unlike standard USB, it's going to be a lot faster. You're looking at a, a fair percentage more. So, so that's how I was connected. This is, was not an SSH connection or anything like that. This was a direct USB connection, exactly like it will be with our Odroid XU4. Reason I'm not looking at it on an Odroid XU4 tonight, and I'm actually doing this using my laptop, is strictly for the sake of the demonstration. This is a series of, um, of demonstrations and projects that are going to be leading to our MyNAS. So cat5.tv slash MyNAS is where it's all going to come together. Uh, but the XU4 is going to be one of the steps in the process of creating this unit. But I wanted to show you the kind of underlying uh, way that we're going to be setting things up. And I want you to learn how some of these... Uh, 
these little Linux commands work in the terminal as well, because everything's going to be done in the terminal. Any other questions for us? BP9, you're very welcome. Um, the foo calling this DAS. Yes, right now in this instant, this in this instance, this is direct attached storage. Um, the idea is that we're going to be taking this DAS unit and turning it into a pseudo NAS or backup system using an XU4. So the XU4 is going to become the brains of this, and then I'm going to be able to access it as network attached storage. So I'm not going to have to plug it into my laptop. No, I'm going to be able to access it through Wi-Fi, through uh, Ethernet, and those kinds of things. Did I miss any other questions? Now, I'm watching the chat room on my phone, and so the screen is uh, comparatively small, and uh, things do tend to kind of fly by the screen. So if there are any other questions about um, the project or what I'm teaching here tonight, uh, I'm wide open. Great to see everybody here and uh, appreciate you being here. Uh, I think that that was really the, the main question. Eh? Um, BP9? Yeah, okay, so you get it now. Wondering how I was able to connect directly to the NAS unit because it's not a NAS and exactly like the Foo says, it's direct attached storage in this instance. That's all going to be changing though. And if you're not familiar with an XU4, Odroid XU4, it is a microcomputer. So think of a Raspberry Pi. It's a very, very small computer. Fits in my pocket right here. Uh, I wish I had it with me, but there, oh, I, I actually, if you can excuse me for one moment, I can grab one. I have one just off the set here. Here we go. So this is an Odroid XU4Q. And the Q stands for quiet because it has this massive heat sink. So this is the board that is going to power our NAS unit. So when this becomes a NAS, this is going to be the computer, the brains, that is going to power it. It's got Debian Linux, uh, Debian 10 on here, uh, on a micro SD right now. It's going to be on EMMC. And then we're going to be setting up some form of mounting in order to hide this um, in such a way that it's going to be part of the uh, the unit itself. It's something that we can just put into a, uh, a room in the, you know, if you have a closet or something that you can set that up and just run an ethernet cable to this that has gigabit ethernet and that's going to give you full access to uh, all the files and make your backups and everything else. So, all right, thanks for the questions, everybody. Um, I, I am welcome, I welcome your questions. You can email live at category5.tv if you have any more. All right, so let's jump right into it. Here are the stories that we're covering in the Category5.tv newsroom. For the first time, BBC News published a news story for every constituency that declared election results overnight, all written by a computer. A Russian police raid on NGINX's Moscow office last Thursday has raised concerns among users of the popular web and proxy server software. Linux has destroyed every competing OS in the supercomputer market, taking a 100% share of the top 500. And remember when the owner of cryptocurrency exchange Quadriga CX passed away, taking hundreds of millions in customer crypto to the grave with him? Well, now investors are beginning to wonder if he actually died or if he just took the money and ran. Stick around. The full details are coming up later in the show. This is the Category 5.TV Newsroom, covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. I'm Robbie Ferguson, filling in this week for Sasha Rickman. Some quick honorable mentions. Uh, well, HP is fighting a very real environmental problem by building their laptops out of ocean-bound plastics. In September, HP introduced their Elite Dragonfly Notebook, the world's lightest compact business convertible, and get this, the world's first notebook made with ocean-bound plastic. HP also announced its commitment to include ocean-bound plastic materials in all of its new HP Elite and Pro desktop and notebook computers launching in 2020. 
This move reflects HP's commitment to addressing the growing challenge of ocean plastics. To date, HP has sourced more than 1 million pounds of ocean-bound plastics. That's the equivalent of more than 35 million plastic bottles. They've been using it in their ink cartridges, HP Elite Display E273D monitors, and now the HP Elite Dragonfly. A new high-end Linux laptop has launched that is more powerful than a MacBook Pro. And it could even be uh, more powerful than System 76's Oryx Pro. It's called the Kubuntu Focus and is a joint effort between the Kubuntu Council, Tuxedo Computers, and Mindshare Management. The target audience for the Kubuntu Focus is users who find the MacBook Pro too limiting in power and compatibility with Linux. But looking at the specs, it looks like a dreamy system for Linux power users, gamers, content creators, and developers as well. This isn't a laptop designed for, uh, from the ground up, however. The Kubuntu Focus takes roughly the same approach as System76 does by taking a stock Clevo unit and adapting it for Linux. This one is specifically tuned for battery life and an optimal NVIDIA KDE experience out of the box. Now, quick specs look like this. A Core i7-9750H, 4.5 gigahertz turbo processor, Keep in mind, this is a laptop. Whew. A GTX 2060 GPU with 6 gigabits of onboard RAM, uh, gigabytes of onboard RAM, 32 gigabytes of system RAM, 1 terabyte NVMe storage, and a 16.1 1080p full HD IPS display with a matte finish. All this will come in for less than the price of a MacBook Pro with the estimated sale price at about $2,400. Now let's get into the top stories that we're following this week in what the BBC says is their biggest test of machine-generated journalism so far. BBC News published a news story for every constituency that declared election results overnight, all written by a computer. Each of nearly 700 articles, most in English but 40 of them in Welsh, was checked by a human editor before publication. Now, the head of the project said that the tech was designed to enhance the service provided, not to replace human reporters. Robert McKenzie, editor of BBC News Labs, says, This is about doing journalism that we cannot do with human beings at the moment. Using machine assistance, they were able to generate a story for every single constituency that declared during last week's general election, Now, which they say would not have been even possible with human reporters. Several news organizations are testing automated journalism as a way of covering data-driven stories more efficiently. The technology can quickly produce stories focused on numbers, such as, say, football, football scores, um, company financial reports, and general election results, obviously. Now, Mr. McKenzie said that the articles reflected a uh, BBC style because the choice of phrases could, in fact, be programmed in advance by BBC writers. He said, quote, as a journalist, you try to think of every conceivable permutation of a story in advance. Then you write a template. Now, the machine selects particular phrases or particular words in response to precise pieces of data. So you can write everything if you want to in house style, he says. He goes on to clarify this clearly only works on stories that are grounded in data. It is not a technology that allows you to do any kind of analysis. How interesting is that? So it makes sense. I love that things can be aggregated and then put into language that we can understand and, and read. And, and, and it's been happening for years, but now it's actually happening in, in news source as well. And it's not really, I mean, it, you could say that, hey, this is a, this is some people may have a, an, an issue with automation, AI, writing the news. But this is data. This is like stuff that in the middle of the night, cryptocurrency numbers are changing and so a report could be generated in something other than just a list of numbers. No, it can be put into language that we can understand and appreciate and, and read. 
uh, at our convenience. So I think it can be a really good thing. And I do appreciate that the BBC is saying that this is something that is meant to augment uh, their current reporting. So it's not something that's going to put people out of work. No, it's something that's going to give them um, additional content that they don't have to actually sit down and write. They can just proofread it and make sure it's good and then push the AOK go. What do you think? Let us know your comments below. A Russian police raid on NGINX's Moscow office last Thursday has raised concerns among users of the popular web and proxy server software. Several employees, including chief developer Igor Siyasiyov, we'll just say Igor, and co-founder Maxim, I'm just going to leave it at that. They were interviewed by police over a criminal copyright infringement complaint. Now, get this, the raid arrived a week after Russian search engine and internet firm Rambler, um, they, who was the former employer of one of those aforementioned, uh, they claimed full ownership of the Nginx code. In addition, Rambler Internet Holdings is requesting the equivalent of about 810,000 US dollars. Nginx, a firm created in 2011 to provide support for users of the open source web server software of the same name, was bought by US firm F5 Networks for $670 million back in March. Nginx was first released, as far as the software goes, in 2004. Around a third of the web's servers in the world use Nginx, often as a load balancer. Even if Rambler can prove their case against Nginx, F5 wants to calm fears about future support and product development by reminding its users that master software builds of its open source software are stored outside of Russia. How scary is that? So. If what they're saying is true, so the claim is that this guy worked at Rambler, and while he was working there, presumably on company time, was developing Nginx, and so now they're saying, hey, that's our software. He was on company time. That's a scary thing. And and what does that mean for for the, like, the world of open source because nginx is huge the th like in the top three like apache's in there um i don't know who the number two is can't be iis that'd just be wrong but we'll just say nginx is in the top three um interesting thing about rambler is that it seems like they are going after a lot of individuals and companies right now. I don't know if their legal department has changed or if they've just said, hey, let's look at ways to bring income out of other things. Like they're suing Twitch right now. So Twitch, the online gaming community, the, the broadcast video, used to be Justin.tv. Rambler is suing them because uh, of users using the Twitch service to rebroadcast um, uh, football games and things like that illegally. Well, Twitch says it's not really our fault. Like, we offer the platform. We have the policies in place that say you're not allowed to do that. If someone does, though, it's not like we have uh, people policing it. Uh, if we knew about it, if you had have come to us, if Rambler had have come to us, we would have shut it down. So in retro, as retroactive as this is to try to sue us over this, like they're trying to, to they're actually trying to have Twitch blocked in Russia. Like they're doing all kinds of stuff. And here, Nginx, the, one of the top three um, web server softwares in the world, and it's, it's open source software, is under attack severely, rated and and. Who knows what's going to happen next? So we're going to keep eyes on that and find out um, over the course of the next couple of weeks what is going to be happening with Nginx. Now, we've got to take a really quick break. Uh, the Crypto Corner and more of this week's top tech stories are going to be coming right up, so don't go anywhere. Welcome back to the CryptoCon. This week has been brutal. 
market cap went down from 200 billion to now around 175 billion. Bitcoin dropped around 10%, other coins dropped 15, 16%. It's been hard. Some of you will be celebrating, uh, some of you will be sad. Those that are celebrating see the opportunity to buy more of their coins. And those that are sad are thinking of uh, leaving this community. Now, <clears throat> what advice can I give you here? Because I've been through this here many times. And my advice is very simple, is when you form your opinion, just listen to a group of people. So don't listen to one single person, listen to a group of people and form your opinion that way. And why? Because this, this, this industry is not regulated. So there, it's an international uh, market and therefore there are many experts. Everybody can be an expert here. In the traditional industry, like stocks, for example, there are experts that only do, for example, forecasting 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, it's a local thing, it's regulated, not the crypto industry. So be careful, uh, take your decisions very uh, carefully. And as I recommend, listen to a multitude of uh, experts, not to only one person. So what else has happened this week? One thing, Mongolia, um, they are now implementing the possibility to purchase uh, or to pay with the taxi fare with the stable coin, which is great. I mean, on an international basis, it's small, but it's great news for our industry. Then the European Central Bank, uh, Christine Lagarde, uh, started talking uh, in a press conference about uh, the future of, uh, of cryptocurrencies within the ECB. And they're building a task force which goes in line with what Italy is doing and Sweden is doing and Lithuania is uh, issuing uh, uh, crypto collectibles. So all good news around that area. Something that I found interesting is also Ripple now has over 450 employees. Uh, so it's a substantial size and I thought that was worth mentioning. And last but not least, uh, in the case of Quadriga, the lawyers are now pushing towards uh, physical evidence that the owner has passed away. Um, so that's going to be interesting and in this channel we're going to continue reporting about that. Um, what's the subject of the week? Subject of the week is going to be mining. There is one website which is called whattomine.com where you can calculate or, uh, how much profit you're going to make if you select one or the other coin and you start mining that coin. I do recommend that you try to mine something, just select any coin, use your Raspberry Pi for this year. It's a great experience. You learn a lot about how to, how this, how a cryptocurrency or blockchain technology really works. And uh, if you select it carefully, you also will make some money. Don't focus on the real big ones like Ethereum or Bitcoin, because from my point of view that you don't have any chance, you don't learn a lot. Take those that are really small and that support, for example, a Raspberry Pi or a CPU, um, and you will learn a lot. So it's just because we're technology focused here. It's something that I do recommend. And that's for me. So I wish you a great week and I'm looking to for, I'm looking forward to see you soon. Thank you for watching. Thank you, Robert. Just a reminder to our community that we're not giving financial advice here. We're just sharing what's happening in the cryptocurrency market. It's clear that Linux is ruling the world of supercomputers as the latest from Top 500 reports that Linux is now the operating system of choice on all of the fastest 500 supercomputers in the world. Top 500 is an independent project that was launched in 1993 to benchmark supercomputers. It publishes the uh, details of the top 500 fastest supercomputers known to them twice per year. On their website, you can filter the list based on various criteria, such as country, operating system, vendor, and so on. Now, 20 years back, most of the supercomputers in the world ran the closed source Unix operating system. But eventually, Linux took the lead and became the preferred choice. Supercomputers are specific devices built for specific purposes. This requires a custom operating system optimized for those specific needs. So the fact that Linux is 
open source and easily modified to suit the individual supercomputer needs is likely why it's the only choice. Out of the top 10 fastest supercomputers in the world, USA has five, China has two, while Japan, Germany, and Switzerland have, Switzerland, pardon me, have one each. No surprise. I feel like, I feel like Windows used to be on that list. It totally makes sense, though, that open source is like, absolutely, I've never really given that much thought. But the fact that, say, Windows server operating system is a closed sourced OS, as is Mac OS, well, it makes sense that I would, as a developer, as a creator of a supercomputer, I'd want something that I can customize. And of course, they're going for the fastest. They want the best speeds. And how do we get to be the fastest? custom compiled software it has to be compiled on that architecture on that hardware that's what's so cool about linux i mean that's what's so appealing about say gen 2 or even arc linux in the world of linux for power users because you can compile the entire operating system on the specific hardware that you're going to be running it on so you're going to get the the absolutely optimal speed out of that system, presumably, because it's going to be compiled specifically for the architecture and hardware that you have. That's cool. 100%. 100%. Yes. In late January, the wife of cryptocurrency exchange founder testified that her husband inadvertently took at least $137 million of customer assets to the grave when he died without giving anyone the password to his encrypted laptop. Now, just a moment ago, we heard from Robert on the Crypto Corner about this, and, and we're just going to go into more details. Now, see, what's happened is, is that outraged investors want to exhume the founder's body to make sure that he's actually dead. So this is, this is news all around. It's not just cryptocurrency news. This is like, this is a, a whole shift, in, a, a whole new way that I, I never, it, it never even crossed my mind that this could be a scam. And now it's like, could it be a scam? Just to kind of rem remind us what happened. So back in February 2019, the wife of Jerry Cotton, the founder of Quadriga CX Cryptocurrency Exchange, submitted an affidavit stating that he died suddenly while vacationing in India at the age of just 30. The cause complications of Crohn's disease, a bowel condition that is in fact rarely fatal. At the time, Quadriga CX lost control of at least $137 million in its ca customer assets because it was stored on a laptop that, according to the widow's affidavit, only Cotton knew the password to. His widow, Jennifer Robertson, said that the laptop stored his cold wallet. Now, that's a digital wallet that's not connected to the Internet. And it contained the digital currency belonging to customers of the exchange. According to Robertson, after attempts to guess his password, she went on to hire experts to attempt to decrypt the laptop, but they too failed. One expert even profiled Cotton in an attempt to hack the computer, but that attempt also came up with nothing. On Tuesday, the New York Times reported that the amount of the exchange clients were unable, the amount that they were unable to access is now, in fact, calculated to be $250 million. Meanwhile, law enforcement officials in both Canada, where Quadriga CX is located, and in the United States, are investigating potential wrongdoing, and investors are clamoring for proof that Cotton is actually dead. Lawyers representing exchange clients on Friday asked Canadian law enforcement officials to exhume his body and conduct an autopsy to confirm both its identity and the cause of death. According to a report from an auditing firm hired by the Supreme Court of Nova Scotia, Quadriga CX has transferred, quote, significant volumes of cryptocurrency unquote, into personal accounts held by Cotton on other exchanges. That sounds kind of damning. 
The report also documented that the transfer, uh, it documented the transfer of substantial funds to Cotton personally that had no clear business justification. An autopsy is unlikely to lead to the recovery of the missing cryptocurrency, but it would go a long way to confirming or debunking the claims that Cotton died at the time and in the manner disclosed to Quadriga CX customers. As I said, like I can't even fathom that this could be fraudulent. And I don't want to believe that. I want, I, I mean, just like I'm sure the, the courts want to know that, yes, this was in fact what happened. I want to believe that it was an honest story. But I think what it, what it raises is that cryptocurrency has the, has opened this whole new method of somebody taking the money and running. And even if that's not the case here with Quadriga CX, it certainly is an eye opener to think that, Hey, this could in fact happen. Hollywood got to get a hold of this folks, because this could make a heck of a great hacker movie. I got to say, Hmm. Hey, big thanks this week to Roy W. Nash, Johnny A. Solbu, and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us this week. Thank you for watching the Category 5.TV Newsroom. And don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And if you appreciate what we do, become a patron at patreon.com slash newsroom. From the Category 5.TV newsroom and filling in for Sasha Rickman this week, I'm Robbie Ferguson. And that's all the time that I have with you this week, but it has been fantastic being here. Uh, and uh, we are actually on a little bit of a vacation, if you will. Of course, Christmas is coming, and so is New Year, and both of those fall on Wednesdays. So our next live broadcast will be January 8th. So if you watch us live each and every week, hey, just keep in mind, we won't be here for two weeks. And that's in lieu of the holidays, and uh, we appreciate all of you for being here. Thank you so much for giving us uh, an opportunity to have a little bit of time off and spend some time with our family. Uh, we will be um, in the studio off and on and checking in with patrons. So if you are a patron, make sure you watch our Patreon profile, patreon.com slash category five. Uh, if you're not yet a patron, uh, please consider that. Um, it's a great way to support Category 5 Technology TV and everything that we do. It is, again, patreon.com slash category five. And by doing that, um, you will be able to participate in anything that happens over the holidays uh, as we will be uh, posting vlogs and behind the scenes videos as we do some things around here in preparation for what we believe is going to be a very powerful year for Category 5 Technology TV. Our very first show, January 8th, is going to be huge. You don't want to miss it. And uh, a lot of preparations is going into it. So that's why we, uh, that's part of why uh, we do need some time um, away from the weekly broadcast as well so that we can really hone in on the quality of that program. So I can't wait to see you January 8th. Hey, Merry Christmas to all of you uh, and a Happy New Year. All the best for 2020 and to good health and uh, we appreciate you being a part of our community thank you everybody and on behalf of everybody who's involved with category 5 tv i know um, it was a bit of a surprise that uh, it was going to be just me flying solo this week um, just due to weather here in barry ontario uh, but on behalf of our our staff here at category 5 tv just want to thank you for being a part of the show in 2019 it's been a great year and uh, we are so excited about all that's to come. Thanks, everybody. Take care. All the best.